Hello and welcome to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. I have been gardening here in southwestern Kentucky, zone 7B for going on five seasons. So my first garden in this space was 2019, the dead of summer, and I got a really late start to that garden, but it was magical. It was such a wonderful first garden experience. I kind of wish that I could have taken you there with me, but I wasn't YouTubing at the time, but I'm YouTubing now and this is the second time that I will be uh, showing you the progression of the garden throughout the season. Last year's garden tours were such an amazing success. We had so many good things go on. We all learned so much together and I'm looking forward to repeating that again this year. So I actually have a lot less going on in the garden now than I had at this time last year. Last year we had such a mild start to the springtime that I felt like my cool weather brassicas really, really thrived. I also was growing a couple different varieties of things like broccoli last year that I didn't grow this year but I kind of wished I had but one of the benefits of growing in a place like this where we have such a long growing season is that I can actually plant two different rounds of brassicas one in the spring and one of the fall so we do get a second chance at brassicas this year I do have a couple brassicas in the garden this year now some of them are bolting or going to seed but some of them are actually doing quite well so this is an example of one of the heirloom varieties that we grow here going to seed this is a purple of Sicily cauliflower, and I have really enjoyed this variety. This is an example of what it looks like when it heads up nicely. This is a nice big head, and it's still not ready to harvest. It could definitely get a little bit bigger. This particular variety of cauliflower is actually a lot more like a broccoli in texture and in flavor, and I am running out of seed. So I've decided to let this plant over here go. It's gonna flower, the pollinators are gonna love it, and then we're gonna be able to collect the seed because that is an heirloom. You can collect seed from hybrid varieties of plants. Problem being that genes or those genes inside those hybrid seed haven't been stabilized yet, so it's kind of anyone's guess what you'll get out of that seed. Heirlooms though, they've been stabilized. They've been working well for people for years and years. And so when we collect seed out of these heirlooms, we're going to be getting that exact thing. Funny story, I actually did not plant potatoes here this year, but we apparently left some in the ground from last year. I think these might be purple molly or molly's purple variety. There's some here. And then I noticed that there is a potato volunteering here. So I'm gonna leave them in there, why not? The rest of what you see here is actually corn. I think this is the peaches and cream variety of corn that I planted here. I was going to plant a bantam sweet corn and I still may, I just have to find another spot for it. But back to the theme of brassicas, I have a variety of cabbage that I can't pronounce but I really like to grow. It seems to be decently heat tolerant and these plants are getting huge. Look at this head down in here. Still not super firm yet, but it's getting there. So see these flowers in here? These are actually cabbage plants as well. This is what a cabbage look lo looks like when it goes to seed. And I have actually never seen this before. I've never had a cabbage go to seed. But again, I'm running out of this seed as well. So this is more than welcome. See these really cool flowers? What happens is they turn into these really nifty seed pods and the seed pods will turn brown and when they mature, the seeds inside will turn black and that's when I can save them. Look at this one. This one has a whole ton of seed pods on there. Within each pod is right around eight to 12 individual seeds and so there's a lot on here. Got a few little herbs sprinkled throughout. This is dill. Dill is one of my absolute favorite herbs of all time. And over here is my giant oregano. It's actually due to be harvested for the first time. There's a weed in there. And I'll definitely bring you back for harvesting day so I can show you exactly what I do. But essentially what I do is I just give this a pretty massive haircut. It's quite extreme, quite intense, but this thing can handle it. Oregano is in the mint family and mints are very, very vigorous. They're very hard to kill. So you can be kind of brutal with them. At least once they're established. <laughs> this guy is, he's from the early days. So as I normally do, I started most of the garden from seed, um, but I did buy a couple things at our local plant nursery because some of the things that I started from seed really didn't do super well in the seed medium that I had put them in. And I fertilized them and I've got them here now and I'll show you some of my stunted plants, but I did find a really good deal on some peppers 
and some tomatoes. So I've got those over there and I'll show you those too. But these are the, some of the peppers that I started from seed. They're starting to do a little bit better since I've fertilized them. What I need to do is just stick them in the garden. There's a lot more nutrition in these beds than in these pots and it's just gonna be better for them for me to get them moved over. I just have not done it yet. Let's see, we've even got some pretty cool things like tamarillos, but they're teeny, teeny, tiny at the moment. Speaking of teeny tiny, I happen to notice that there are a couple little volunteer gooseberries in this bed. I said gooseberry, I'm pretty sure they're ground cherries. I don't know the difference, but I get corrected every time I say one or the other. There's these little yellow um, globes, like little tiny, almost like cherry tomatoes. They're in the same family, they're a nightshade. They're beautiful, but they're super, super sweet. And I think, I think the packet, my sister-in-law gave me these original plants. I think it said Molly's ground cherry. And ever since we stuck them in this bed, it doesn't matter how many amendments we add, how much mulch or what, they always volunteer here every year. And they're absolutely welcome. There's actually a whole bunch we might have to transplant some of these because that's kind of close together. So here's an example of some of the peppers that I bought at our local nursery, sweet and healthy mix. So it's a bell pepper of, you know, any kind of color variety. I actually wasn't aware of this until I started gardening, but you know, the different colors of peppers, they don't come all different colors on one plant. Each color comes on only one plant. The genetics for those colors are in the one seed. And so the one plant that grows is just gonna grow that one color. And they all start green. And that's why green peppers are cheaper at the store. There's a lot less time involved in getting those out to you on the shelf. These eggplants, I started from seed. They started doing really well when I stuck them in the garden, although they are still kind of small. You'll see that I have a few different marigold plants sprinkled throughout as well. And all along back here on this cattle panel trellis are different varieties of tomatoes. Same thing behind the cabbages, all tomatoes. Some of these are heirloom slicer varieties. Some of these are cherry varieties. I forget what I put where, except for I do know right here and right here, these are the Belgian giants. These are my favorite heirloom tomato to grow. I very highly anticipate tomato sandwiches with those things. The reason I love them so much is they're not super seedy. They don't have a lot of that gel on the inside, so they're not super watery. They've got a lovely meaty meatiness to them, a lovely bite, and they're just my favorite. And they have a really nice skin that is not prone to cracking. We can have cracking issues here when we have really extreme heat in the summer and then we get a whole bunch of rain kind of kind of can do in tomatoes, but those guys do really well. So you can probably notice the difference between this tomato leaf here and this tomato leaf here. So there is a difference in color and these ones came from the local greenhouse and probably needed to be acclimated more to the sun before I stuck them out, but they're doing okay. I'm not really talking about the color, but I'm talking about the shape. Those rounder, less jagged tomato leaf shapes are called potato leaf tomatoes and I think it's kind of cool. Tomatoes and potatoes are in the nightshade family and some tomatoes just have those kinds of leaves. So this potato leaf plant that I talked about here, this is a brandy wine tomato and I forget what this one is, but that's like a regular tomato leaf shape. See, and this is the potato. Doesn't it look similar? Over here we have our onions and elephant garlic and all of it is shooting up some flowers which does happen um, in this area around this time it's not ideal to have either one of these things flower but i don't mind it i find that the pollinators really enjoy the flowers and then at least with the onions i know that i get to collect the seed this is only my second year growing elephant garlic and it's doing really well um, i've never seen the elephant garlic flower and i've never figured out what happens after a flower so we're gonna find that out this year. I do know that you can collect these garlic scapes. That's what this uh, stem is here on the garlic flower. And these make a really great pesto, or you can just dice them up and saute them and put them really in anything. They're really good on scrambled eggs. They've got a very mild garlicky, oniony flavor that even kids like. I think I'm gonna do that with some of the garlic scapes here, but I do wanna leave some of them to flower. I wanna see what they look like. I think I remember seeing that the elephant garlic flower is like a purple orb. Cool. 
The onion flower bulbs are a little bit different. They're hollow on the inside. As far as I know, people don't eat them. I don't know why you couldn't. A lot of people will cut off the flower stalks just to help the bulbs in the ground get a little bit bigger. Um, I'm not super worried about that. I do know that once the flower stalk kind of pierces down into the bulb below, it can affect the storage life of the onion. When we preserve our onions, we just dice them and put them in the freezer, so it's not a big deal to me. I really like how these flowers look in the garden. I really like what they mean to the pollinators, and again, we get to collect some seed from them. So I'm just gonna leave the onions alone. Back here, this is a hard neck variety of garlic, just your regular old one of the mill table garlic and this is actually looking like it might be getting close to being harvestable it's got some scapes as well these look really different than the elephant garlic scapes i'm pretty sure elephant garlic is more closely related to leeks than this table garlic here but i'm just gonna poke down in and kind of assess what's happening down here it's definitely not finished doing its thing, but I can tell that those bulbs are really starting to swell. So I promised Mandy that I would show everybody the cactus that is in my garden. So I actually have two little cactus varieties. Whoa, I'm gonna fall into it. <laughs> I actually have two different cactus varieties in my garden. They're of the same family. They're of Optunia variety, and this is just a prickly pear variety. What they're doing is putting on new pads, and I'll show you the difference between new pads and flowers. This plant right here is going to be putting on a ton of flowers. The bees love them and they do fruit. I have never done any, anything with the fruit. I've heard that you can. Uh, maybe this is the year for that. I said that last year and I never did anything. You guys are gonna have to hold me to it. This here's a brand new pad. You can see how the spines are more wiggly at this young stage. And this is going to be a flower. So you can see all along here, these are all going to be flowers. When we first put these beds in, I just kind of stuck the prickly pears down in there, not really intending for that to be their final resting place, but then they rooted down through the pot that they're in, this one here, and then the one over there, and I'm terrified to move them. So now they live there. This one lives here. So this actually is a Santa Rita prickly pear. You can see the different color. And this one here is also putting on new pads here and these are gonna be flowers as well. So the cactus will actually root along the pads. So where the pads have spilled out into the garden bed here, it's gonna root down and get some more nutrients for the plant. This is actually an asparagus frond doing its asparagus thing. I've got a couple different asparagus plants here that I've been harvesting off of. And under here, this was a volunteer lettuce plant. A volunteer plant, just like those gooseberries over there, is a plant that grows just because the seed fell and not necessarily because you asked it to grow or you planted something there. So this was seed that fell last year and now we have a brand new plant, which I probably need to harvest soon. We've had some pretty hot days and things like leafy greens like that uh, really get kind of bitter in the summer heat. It'll trigger them to bolt eventually or go to seed. And I really want to eat that. Another leafy thing that we have going on here is some kale. This is looking a little bit droopy, like maybe it needs some water. This one's okay. Oh, this one, ooh. This one has a problem down at the base. That's what happened. That's okay. When I take out the plants like this, I try to leave as much soil behind as I can. So I'm just knocking the roots off, but look. Ooh, something happened to that. That's all right. We have some red Russian or ragged jack kale. That's doing really great. And there's one little lone Lacinato or dinosaur kale plant in here. Same thing with those. Pretty soon it's gonna get too hot. They'll start to taste bitter. And if I let them go to seed, they will. And I just might this year. Being planted that close together, there's a chance that we could get a cross variety of the two different types of kale. And that would be pretty cool. So back here we have quite a few different perennials. These are Ozark Beauty strawberries. These are an ever bearing variety. You can tell we've got lots of blooms and where there's blooms, there's fruit. Look at it all. Wow. 
got some ripening right there. It's not quite ready. We have had a little bit of bird pressure and this is to be expected. I have heard of people creating rock pets, essentially, like they've painted rocks to look like strawberries and stuck them in around their strawberries. And when the birds peck those, they kind of just learn, you know, those red things aren't edible. And so when your real strawberries come on, they leave them alone. I probably need to do that. You can see, that one's been eaten too. We have gotten a few out of here. That one's going to be so nice. So there's a couple different spots around the garden where you'll see garlic coming up randomly. I have grown garlic in quite a few spots in the garden and kind of like the potatoes, you harvest as many as you think you have and then you inevitably leave a clove or two behind. This looks like I left an entire bulb of garlic and it has, it has done the thing. It's growing. <laughs> see, look at that. I think there's probably a whole bulb under there that sprouted and now became several plants. This will be interesting to harvest. We've got some rhubarb over here. This is a smaller plant. This particular crown flowered last year. There's a whole bunch of little tiny stalks in there. This here is actually volunteer cilantro. So I had a cilantro plant growing right there last year and it got big and flowered and threw some seed down. And now we have many more cilantro plants and they're starting to get tall and flower as they do. Cilantro is very, very sensitive to the heat and our summers come on just like that. And so in response to the heat, they're going to flower and go to seed, which is fine. The seed of the cilantro plant is actually the spice coriander, which makes a really nice bread. So we look forward to harvesting some of that. This crazy thing bending over, this is just another really large um, asparagus frond that I let go. Usually when I'm harvesting asparagus, I will harvest the spears that are the width of a pencil or greater when they're about 12 inches long or longer. Usually if they get much longer than 12 inches, they'll start to kind of spread out and frond out. And they still taste really good when they're like that, uh, but it's just not what we're used to. So every day when it's rainy and warm, I have to come out and harvest because this stuff, I swear if I sat here and watched it grow, I could see it. Cause see, I was out here earlier and I don't remember these guys being this far along. These guys, I'll have to harvest tomorrow. So these ones hiding under here. Those will be ready probably also tomorrow. Let's see little thin ones like this. These ones I let do the frond thing. These guys will collect the sun, the sun's energy all year long. And when the season's over, they'll put all that energy back into the crown and we'll get more asparagus next year. This space in the garden right here is actually where I had my original patch of elephant garlic last year. And this is about as much garlic as I planted last year. So I let it go a little bit long before I harvested it. And it had started to develop these little, I think they're called garlic corms on the underside of the bulb. So we had the bulb of garlic and then underneath were these teeny little cloves. They're tiny in comparison to the elephant garlic cloves and they kind of fall off of the bottom really easily. And I've read that you can plant the corms and get elephant garlic and lo and behold, here we go. Now we may only have bulbs that are basically the equivalents of one bulb of garlic, um, but we'll just have to see. I don't know. I've never done this before. Really cool experiment and the space in the garden is free. So there they are. I realized too that I probably should have talked about why I have these collars around all of my tomato plants. So because my tomato plants are small right now, I have had in the past issues with something coming along and literally just cutting off all of my plants. So I'd spend, you know, eight weeks nurturing and babying these things inside and then a week or two, you know, getting them used to the outside only for something to saw them off overnight. And what I think happened is either rodents or probably cutworms. Cutworm is one of the worst things in the garden, but it's one of the easier things to manage the most organically, in my opinion. They really just need a barrier to where they can't get to your plant in order to harm it. And these little cups, I cut the bottom out and kind of secured them with some garden staples and this does the trick. So eventually when these things get a little bit bigger and a little bit more sturdy, 
they are less of a risk of being taken out by the cutworms and I can remove these. And because they're styrofoam, they're really easy just to rip and remove. The stalk of this plant and the stem is probably sturdy enough to where I wouldn't have to worry about the cutworms, but I'm gonna leave it on for now. I have these two U-shaped beds in the front of the garden here and half of this one belongs to this massive thornless blackberry plant. We put it in a couple years ago and I just learned this year that you only get fruit on the canes or the new wood, the new growth that was put up the year prior. So because these were essentially new plants last year, they just did a whole ton of growing the green things and not a lot of putting on the berries, but they're making up for that this year because everything that grew last year now has flower buds on it this year. And just like the strawberries, where there's flowers, there's fruit. This here is brand new growth from this year. Most of the growth uh, that came on last year is actually on the other side, but see this blackberry flower here? There's actually quite a few just on this cane alone. Look at all these buds. Look at that. Where I grew up in my house in Maine, or at the house in Maine, not in it, <laughs> there was a huge, I don't even know how big, blackberry patch um, between our house and the neighbor's house. And I have very fond memories crawling through that blackberry patch and collecting as many blackberries as we could eat. Like that's probably what my sister and I had for lunch on most days. And there was still enough to gather and can. And those are great memories. Those blackberries had spines. These ones do not. See, look at them all. They're barely starting to open. Next week, this should be pretty impressive, look. Are blackberries kind of invasive? Yes. Am I mad about it? No. This arch trellis here eventually is going to have loofah gourds and birdhouse gourds growing on it. I do have a couple little tomatoes over here and for right now, there's actually a bunch of peas. So on either end of this archway here is a tomato. So there's one here and then there's a brandy wine down on that end. Same thing here. So these guys are gonna grow up the front and back side of the trellis. And for now, the sweet peas are really taking off in the garden. So these I think are, I don't know if they're called arrowhead, arrow peas. There's some kind of variety that has to do with arrow. And I actually planted these twice. The first round of peas that I put in really got eaten up by the birds, those little tender brand new leaves. The first leaves of spring probably that those birds really got a chance to taste, uh, they tasted them and it kind of knocked them down a lot. But I, I replanted this side in particular. And so they're planted quite densely, but it's been working out okay. They found the trellis, they're crawling up and they're even starting to flower and fruit. See his beautiful pea flowers here. Gorgeous. Hmm. Look at the mushrooms under here. How cool is that? See, here's that potato leaf brandy wine. Now this one is a lot less yellow than the one that was on the other side of the garden, mostly because these peas are shielding it from the harsh afternoon sun. Our particular plot of land does not have very many trees. So there are some, you can see some right there. Those do shade this garden in the afternoon, but it's fine because we get so much sun that it's not required that we get an entire full day of sun. Um, really full sun is about six to eight hours of sun. So if you've got a seed packet or a plant that says it needs full sun, and you've got at least that much, you're golden. On the end of this bed here, I planted quite a few sunflowers. I had been thinning them out to just one sunflower per hole, but then the birds, they came in and started eating them. So I figured I let them get a little bit bigger before I took them down to one per hole. But these are from seed that I saved, I think last year, it might've been the year prior. And from what I remember, these sunflowers, I think they're a reddish orange type variety. And they shouldn't get too, too tall, maybe four or five feet, but they're in a two foot bed, so they'll seem really tall. <laughs> Hi. Hi, baby. I made a funny joke and I told it to daddy. What's your joke? Knock, knock. Who's there? Can I buy? Can you buy who? Can I buy you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. Are you enjoying your date? <laughs> 
So I actually broke my lawnmower. I ran over some chicken wire. So it's a little bit crazy looking back here, but I do have a couple different growing spaces back here that we like to grow all kinds of things. We've got our greenhouse right here, and this is gonna be our first year growing in this a long space right here. This is our lane. We are going to grow lots of vining things here that don't really fit in our raised bed garden and don't make sense to really grow in the greenhouse. That's gonna go along here. I've got those seeds started and they're actually looking really good. And of course we can't come back over here without saying hi to the boys. Hi boys. I don't have a bottle today. I do not. Hello. Hello girl. Yes, Pepper, we hear you. We do. There's Titus over there. <laughs> so the greenhouse could look better. Um, it will look better in not very long from now. I just haven't had much in the ground, so I haven't had much of a reason to do too much in here. Things like this exist. Last year, this was a small, I think this is curly dock plant. I didn't take it out because it's technically edible. Um, when I tasted it, it was pretty bitter, probably because it was going to seed. I'm gonna guess that that is biennial. <laughs> but over here is where I've got some seeds started. So these are purple hull pink eye peas. These are a shelling pea. And I didn't have amazing germination on the purple hull pink eye variety, but the black eye variety, these all did really well. And these are gonna be going in the ground really soon. Now, one of the reasons that I didn't just start these guys in the ground is I have a really serious problem with either cutworms or rodents in this space eating the seeds or seedlings basically straight away. I see them germinate and then they're suddenly gone the next day. So in order to help ensure that we get a good head start on these plants, I've put plants that you wouldn't normally start in pots, in start pots, and probably sometime this week or weekend, I'll be putting these in the row. But these plants here, these are the ones that are either gonna go in that long lane with the trellis in between the goats, or these are what is gonna go in the arch trellis in the raised bed garden. So here is a loofah gourd, brand new baby. And this here is a birdhouse gourd. They look the exact same as seedlings, but the seeds look remarkably different. Birdhouse gourds are the strangest looking seeds I've ever seen. They almost look like half of a walnut or a pecan or something. Really bizarre. I need to sow those again. I didn't have amazing germination. I just have one plant, but one is better than none. I've got some bait alpha cucumbers. These are gherkin cucumbers. And then I've got two different varieties of melons back here. We have the Kajari melon. And then this is a variety that I saved from a hybrid that I accidentally grew last year. This is the armpit melon. And this melon has a really great root system, it looks like. The armpit melon is essentially a cross between a Kajari melon and a Charente melon, which is kind of like a cantaloupe. Um, that was an accident. It was a happy accident. Being an F1 hybrid, like I briefly mentioned before, it's not stable. So I'm really not sure exactly what we're gonna, what we're gonna get out of the seed that I saved from that hybrid fruit, but it'll be really fun to see. I do have a couple lima bean plants that did germinate inside some of these holes here. I think there's only three left. Most of what's going to be growing in this space this year is different varieties of beans. I am gonna start them all in start pots. So probably as soon as I get those black eyed peas in the ground, I'll reuse those pots for more different varieties of beans like lima beans. I had planted some different squash varieties on the side here of the greenhouse. And I think I got three of these to germinate as well. I honestly can't remember what's what. So I think this is probably a scallop type summer squash. It's either that or a delicata squash. And I kind of hope it's the latter because delicata, that is a cannon or something. Oh yeah, did you hear that? So we live really close to a military installation. You're gonna hear things like that throughout the summer and throughout the whole year. Um, we don't normally hear things like that though. You hear the gunshot and then you wait a few seconds and you hear the impact. That's some kind of big gun. I don't know what Levi could tell me. But anyways, the delicata squash are absolutely beautiful and absolutely delicious. 
I sincerely hope that one of the squash that germinated is one of those varieties, but if not, no big deal. I can always re-sow. That's one of the wonderful things about summer squash is when the summer is really going, they grow and produce really fast. You can go from seed to squash in about 60 days. Our green stock here is full of strawberries. These are strawberry crowns that I put in this year. And these are a lot more protected from the birds in here. Do you see how much smaller this berry is versus some of the berries that were in the raised bed garden? These crowns that I put in here this year, they will fruit and they'll fruit fine. But once the berries have a chance to establish their root system, the subsequent years usually have a better fruit yield. So this is still gonna be good though. That's actually a lot sweeter than some of the fruit that I had out there. Part of that is the watering is so much more controlled in this space that I can really tailor the watering of this green stock here and not allow the fruit to kind of get bogged down and watered out the flavor. That was actually really yummy. I'm hunting for more, but I don't think there's any more ready. Not today. Won't be too long. Well, the sun is starting to set on our first garden tour of the 2023 season. I'm really excited for what this season has in store. Last season, I grew basically just tomatoes and peppers in this space. This year, I'm growing a lot more, a lot more variety, not necessarily in here, but all around the farm. And so our harvest basket should be really, really pleasing. So if you haven't yet, please subscribe. I'm gonna try to post these garden tours every week. In the beginning, like this time of year in May, it may be a little bit more sparse every uh, 10 days to two weeks but it will not be long and we'll be doing it every week because everything is going to be growing like crazy. <laughs>